Welcome to another edition of U.S. Farm Report, brought to you today and each week at this time by men of the National Farmers Organization in this TV viewing area, in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. Today's program, Collective Bargaining for the Dairyman, is a discussion of the many factors involved in improving dairyman's bargaining and marketing power for a brighter and more secure future. Leading today's U.S. Farm Report discussion is Willis Rowell, a farmer from Edgewood, Iowa. We feel that collective bargaining for dairymen uh, is very good, very good and a very timely topic today. We've always maintained in the NFO from the very inception of, of our collective bargaining program that the prices of all farm commodities would have to be brought up and maintained at a relative balance with each other to avoid the producers of one product uh, from shifting uh, to, the produ uh, to producing another product, uh, which in turn would just shift the problems in agriculture. The dairymen, I feel, uh, or seem to feel that are, they're a little bit on the bottom of the totem pole right now in this pricing situation. We've seen some pretty significant successes of the, especially the meat producers. The grain people are doing quite well this year. Uh, while, the, while the dairymen have had some uh, slight increase in the price of milk, they do feel uh, that it is substandard compared to other products. This is why we say that we feel this is quite timely. To help with today's Midwest Farm Report, on the far left, Lawrence Hunsaker, a dairy farmer from Buchanan County. Next, on Lawrence's right, is Vernon Sommerfeld, another dairyman from Buchanan County. And on his right is Maynard Rafferty, dairyman from Powersheet County, Iowa. All of these men certainly feel very keenly about the dairy industry and agriculture in general. So we'll review a few of the dairyman's problems to begin with. Lawrence, I think you probably have some information on what has happened to the price of milk in the last uh, 12 or 14 years. Would you like to fill us in a little on this? Well, the price of milk in the last uh, 12 years or so has uh, dropped tremendously. And the price that we, uh, the consumer pays has went up to uh, 25 cents, 24 a quart in your uh, the milk that we produce on the farm. We get 12 cents a quart, uh, 8 cents a quart, actually. And uh, we've lost all grounds in our milk business, as far as I, I can figure. Well, we've, we've, always, we've heard a lot of comment in the past, Lawrence, that uh, if these farmers would learn a little bit about producing quality milk, uh, that certainly this would be some great benefit. Have you people in the milk industry done anything in the last uh, 10 or 12 years uh, in the uh, to improve the quality of this product? Well, yes, we went from, uh, as the fellow says, horse tank cooling to uh, bulk tanks. Well, first we went to can coolers, and uh, that wasn't satisfactory. And then we went moved on to bulk tank coolers with uh, three or $4,000 investment. We went to pipeline milkers, which is a tremendous investment. Some of us have went to uh, cow stalls and uh, milking parlors and the likes of that, uh, which has always got an added uh, investment to the farmer and to the producer, and with relatively no uh, increase in our price at all. Do you have any uh, method of maintaining these quality standards? Is there any type of inspection uh, that sets these standards for you people? Well, the government sets the, the state inspectors or your uh, city inspectors as your milk orders would go. Uh, set the standards which by by which you must uh, maintain to produce grade A milk and uh, Even re recently now as of July of this year this last year they uh, come out with your grade B and inspect on that even so uh, uh, It looks to me as though uh, There's going to be a pretty high maintenance of quality uh, You mentioned grade A and grade B milk here Lawrence uh, how can we differentiate between these two products? What uh, actually what is grade A milk for and what is grade B milk for? Well, your grade A milk is the milk that goes in the bottle into the bottle for uh, direct consumption uh, by your manufactured milk or your grade grade B milk 
uh, actually is what is processed into uh, cheese and butter and the likes of that. I see. Let's move over to Vernon now and uh, see, see what he can uh, tell us. We hear a lot about the increased <clears throat> price of milk to the consumer, while the farmer's price level has been going down. Uh, Vernon, what, what can you tell us about the marketing costs of milk? What can you tell us about the cost of production? Well, the marketing cost of milk is uh, purely in the hands of the processor. The farmer receives approximately eight cents on grade A milk today. And the consumer is paying, as Lawrence said, about 24 to 25 cents per quart. And uh, I don't know why this big spread, but it is. Well, I, I hear a lot about uh, the price of milk had to go up to the consumer, that marketing costs have risen. But very little publicly has ever been said, uh, to my knowledge, about the, the rising cost of production on the farm. Uh, have your production costs, Vernon, uh, remained stable with 15 years ago? Have they gone down? Have they gone up? What's happened to these production costs? Well, they by no means remain stable. They just keep going up, and, and the milk prices have gone the other way. They, uh, there's no way to stay with it. Being a dairy farmer, you, uh, regardless of uh, how efficient you get when prices are down, you're and the old cow can't produce enough to stay with it. Uh, can, you, can you give us a few of your items, cost items, uh, that have gone up? When we hear production costs, maybe some people don't uh, understand exactly what our production costs out on the farm are. What are some of the items involved in this? Oh, well, your milking equipment. <clears throat> You've got all sorts of equipment around the farm and machinery, hay making equipment, harvesting equipment of all sorts. All this has gone up new and, and repairs are tremendous anymore uh, and your cooling tanks and milk and equipment and all that stuff uh, don't seem to be any limit to it. Uh, what about the taxes on your land that you use to produce the feed for these cows? What's happened to your tax structure well, those in the last taxes few years? Have, those taxes have all gone up and don't see any end to it yet. They tell us we're going to get another increase in taxes this year. I think this points out the fact uh, Vernon, that definitely uh, when we talk about increasing the cost of milk to consumers, that we also should consider the increased cost of production to the farmer. <coughs> Maynard, can you fill us in a little bit uh, on how milk is presently priced? What kind of a pricing structure do you dairymen have to work under? Uh, yes, well, it's... Uh the milk is presently uh, floor. The floor price for milk is guaranteed by the federal government through the Secretary of Agriculture, who has the the power to set the price of milk at 75 to 90 percent of parity. And uh, this has been uh, at or near 75 percent in for a number of years in the recent past. Do you have any idea of uh, why the 75 percent figure is normally used? Well, their criteria for setting this price is uh, to, uh, and I, I can quote very closely, is to guarantee a, a, uh, a plentiful supply of quality milk for the consuming public here in America. And, uh, of course, uh, we've heard so much about surpluses, and we have had a, a small surplus in milk uh, for several years, but uh, uh, just this past year, this surplus has pretty much disappeared, but the price is uh, still uh, is bouncing along uh, at uh, or, or very slightly above this uh, floor price set by the Secretary of Agriculture. Now, our, our co-ops uh, were originally uh, created 50, 70 years ago for the purpose of collective bargaining. and. Uh, when they were first organized, they were uh, fairly successful at this, of, of getting a price for their member uh, producers, the farmers that were the members of them. But uh, as our economy has progressed and, uh, in, in recent years, these co-ops have become uh, relatively uh, ineffectual in, uh, in uh, getting a price that will uh, be in uh, in balance with the rest of our economy to meet our cost of production. I understand uh, Dr. Seaver, uh, an economist from the state of 
Connecticut, uh, made some remarks concerning uh, the farmers pricing their milk. Uh, this might be of interest to our listeners. Can you comment on this, Maynard? Yes, uh, Dr. Seaver uh, is an economist from Connecticut, and he was a speaker at the recent uh, uh, National Farm Institute held at Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, in this, he, uh, he stated that uh, probably what the farmer should do <coughs> is uh, join together in uh, commodity groups for the purpose of, of pricing their farm products. And as he referred to this as collective bargaining, which is what our NFO program is. Now, uh, he pointed out that, that uh, the power of the food chains, and here I quote that, that the growing power of the great food chains to dictate prices and other conditions of the exchange of, uh, of food, but from the farmers uh, on through to the consumer. He, he said that, that uh, we should, all of us in this country, be concerned with this problem. But in the final analysis, we may be forced to depend upon regulatory acts to control the growing power at the retail level. Now, in other words, he pointed out that, that the chain stores have a tremendous power in this field. Then another point that uh, he said, he said, if farmers would attempt to collect his bargain, he said that they would run in trouble with the Sherman antitrust laws. Well, uh, well, it seems to me that, that he has progressed about in his research the point that NFO did in 1958 when NFO uh, decided to look into collective bargaining for farmers. They thought at that time that they needed a, a law uh, to permit this. But as they researched this, they found that we have uh, immunity as farmers from the Sherman Antitrust Law through our capper Volstead Act of 1922. This surplus situation that you mentioned a few minutes ago was uh, quite interesting to me, Maynard. This has been uh, promoted as the crux of all agricultural problems. Uh, surplus products and even some people uh, saying that we had surplus farmers. And you talk about two or three or possibly four percent uh, surplus of your commodity. Are you trying to tell me that you have a price discrimination on 100% of your total production because you produce 2% more than the market needs any given day? Is this basically the situation? Well, I, I believe that we have operated under a price that's based on a surplus. In other words, yes. Uh, the, the price is based on a small part of the surplus, and this is a price that we get paid for 100% of our production. Uh, this means then that maybe 2 or 3% of your milk uh, that the market doesn't need today prices 100% of your production. This is basically true. Yes. Let's talk a little bit of now about the investment in the dairy business. We'll go back to Lawrence for a minute. And uh, Lawrence, what can you tell us about the investment? Uh, what kind of investment do you dairy people have? Who invests in the marketing structure, uh, your cooperative marketing structure? Well, your uh producer uh, does the biggest percent of the investing in your cooperative. He's got the cows and he's got the, the equipment to operate this uh, dairy setup. And he uh, he has the biggest investment by far uh, in the dairy industry. You mean your, your producer invests in the land, he invests in the cows, and then he is also carrying the invest investment of the cooperative marketing structure. Is this right? Well, he does, yes. Uh, in the co-op, he's got they, they uh, deduct a, uh, a uh, what they call a, a, revol a revolving fund, uh, which is actually paying for the operation of the plant. We've established a little bit here now about uh, the dairyman's problems, uh, his costs, uh, the method, the present method of pricing milk. Vernon, what do you think might be the answer? to the dairyman's <coughs> present price dilemma. Well, <clears throat> I think you're going to have to have a organization that can ask for a price and receive it, such as NFO collective bargaining. Uh, it's about the only way out. So you keep a cost of production plus a reasonable return and ride right with this raising cost in uh, producing. 
you like to, uh, Maynard, add anything to this, to these comments? Uh, about what are we going to do about this situation? What are you people as dairymen going to do about it, I should say? Well, I think it's extremely important that we as dairy farmers and, and as all farmers with their respective commodities, that uh, we take hold of this problem and uh, solve it ourselves. Uh, if, if you want a job done and you want to get the job done right, the only way to do it is do it yourself. Now, a lot of people uh, complain about the <coughs> federal, federal government controlled agriculture, and I think this is a serious problem, and it's becoming more so. But uh, this is our own fault by, by our uh, irresponsibility in, in uh, taking care of our own business as farmers, the business of pricing our product. And until we do this, we are inevitably going to drift more and more to uh, federally controlled agriculture. I'd like to visit with you people a few minutes, uh, just about the NFO in general. Uh, while we've got the spotlight on the dairymen today, I, I don't think we should ignore the producer, uh, producers of all other farm commodities. What does the NFO actually amount to? Uh, when we talk about collective bargaining, when we talk about master contracts, when we talk about membership agreements, people. Uh, really, the NFO program is only a method of selling on a nationwide or a national basis. Uh, this has been, the need for this has been brought about uh, certainly due to the growth of your food chain stores that on the retail end of our markets. They have put us in a most helpless position as far as any bargaining power as far as having any voice in the pricing of farm products. Uh, individually, we just cannot compete on any kind of a basis <coughs> with nationwide buyers. This basically is the NFO program. Put together enough of the total production on a nationwide basis so that the buyers of farm commodities just can't fill their needs from any other sources. At this point, they will come to the NFO, they will sign our master contracts, and then we will be in a position uh, to bargain together, to sell together, and to price our products together. We've seen some great strides in collective bargaining uh, in the last year or so. The dairyman perhaps is left a little bit behind, but not certainly not totally. The meat people, I think, have made the, the best progress. Uh, we've seen some real substantial, substantial increases in the price of cattle, and we've seen some almost spectacular increases in the price of live hogs on the farm. This was due, of course, to the NFO marketing arrangements, the spectacular rise in the price of hogs and the rise in the price of beef cattle. Our meat producers have learned how to bargain together, and they've learned how to sell together. And certainly the results are, are, are just outstanding, and certainly they're noticeable. When we find that, according to the USDA figures, that farm income has gone up $2 billion in 1965 over 1964, due basically to the increase in the price of live, livestock sold from the farms. And of course, no state gets the benefit from these kind of prices and price increases like the state of Iowa, because we are the basic agricultural state of our union. So this is the NFO program. By, uh, put together enough of the total production so that we are in a position to bargain for it and bargain on a national level to compete with the chain stores because they buy on a national level. And I don't think we can stress this too much. When we see buyers of farm commodities, uh, let's take just possibly an average size grain processor that needs five to six bush thousand bushels per hour to keep his operation running, uh, are, are we as individuals ever going to be able to get large enough to compete with a buyer like this? Uh, I get around quite a lot of the eastern half of Iowa over a period of uh, a few months. And I see some people maybe with 15 or 20 or 25,000 bushels of corn on their farm, and this is a good operation for any individual farmer. But then I stop and think, this would operate a processing plant four to five hours. 
uh, is he really interested in this man as an individual? But if we put together a lot of individuals like this so that we can talk to this man in terms of enough uh, supply to operate his processing plant for a lot of hours, uh, for maybe several weeks at a time, I'm sure that this is going to put us in a much, much stronger bargaining position. And the meat boys have proved this. They've done a whale of a job. So I think it's time for the dairyman, and this is why the spotlight is on dairy today, it's time for the dairyman to get with it and, and do something about pricing his milk. You haven't been left out of this uh, meat pricing structure completely. Visiting with dairymen, I find that uh, your veal calves are worth a good one, 42, 44 dollars a hundred, compared with maybe 25 or 26 dollars a hundred a year ago. This is a good increase. Uh, your market cows, your cull cows from your dairy herds, I see them selling uh, the better cows from 16 to 18 cents a pound. And I can remember just a short 16 or 18 months ago that many of them were bringing eight and a, eight and a half or nine cents a pound. So without question, uh, you have derived some benefits, but you still got some work to do on your milk. And after all, this is what you're milking cows for, basically, uh, is the milk you produce. I'd like to go back around the table one more time, uh, see if these men that are actively engaged in milking these cows uh, have any more to say about this. Uh, Lawrence, can you add anything to this at all? Well, the only thing I can add to this is that the dairy farmers uh, definitely must organize uh, and uh, establish prices, and they definitely must uh, work towards collective bargaining for agriculture for, for the dairy farmer and for whole agriculture as a whole, or they're going to be uh, in bad way. Well, they, you think they just uh, might stay on the bottom end of this totem pole uh, if they don't get themselves organized, uh, work out a method of bargaining and selling together? Uh, would this be kind of your opinion? Yes, uh, actually the uh, family-sized farmer will, uh, as near as I can see, go clear out of the picture if, uh, if they don't uh, group themselves together and, uh, and do more bargaining, uh, more collective bargaining and, and organize. Vernon, what would you like to add about uh, dairy farmers, uh, what they might do about the pricing of their milk, pro uh, milk products? Well, they... <clears throat> could farm, form, uh, or not form, but put a little pressure on the, mar the market by possibly selling as a group. Uh, your co-ops could do such a thing as that. Put a little pressure on the marketing system that way. There's a number of things probably could be done if they'll just do it. Maynard, you probably have some more ideas about collective bargaining for farmers, the NFO program in general. Uh, would you like to add something to what these boys have already said? Well, uh, of course, uh, NFO has uh, in active in the three basic commodities of meat, grain, and milk, and we have realized from the start that we've got to uh, uh, raise these prices together and balance. We cannot get a good price for one commodity and neglect the others. Uh, th this we are working on with our activities in uh, in uh, meat marketing arrangements and our activities in grain marketing arrangements and our activities in dairy to get uh, uh, these co-ops signed to uh, master contracts and uh, th this is what these uh, milk co-ops need the most they are the weakest in uh, cooperation among co-ops to get <coughs> the price for their farmer members which they were originally created to do now we, we have been accused of being anti-co-op as NFO, but uh, nothing could be farther from the truth because the NFO is, is pro-co-op. We are very much in favor of the cooperative movement, and uh, our program uh, meets the most dire need that the milk co-ops have today. And uh, we can be of, of great assistance to these co-ops who will cooperate with us. And uh, so I would again urge those farmers who are members of co-ops that have not yet signed master milk contracts with the NFO to, uh, to take a look at this, uh, seriously consider it. Uh, this is for their benefit as individual farmers. It is for the benefit of their milk co-op. 
it can mean their survival or, or their, uh, their discontinuance in farming, and it can mean the same thing for the co-op of which they are a member. I think Maynard brought out an interesting point here about our cooperative marketing structure. As they stand now, uh, of course, he mentioned earlier in the program, a number of years ago, this was quite effective as a bargaining tool for farmers. Until we saw the, the buying end of our uh, industry band together in larger groups, our co-ops have remained somewhat separated, uh, operating individually, actually competing with each other uh, for the farmer's supply of milk. I don't think this was the original intent of the cooperative movement. Uh, they have been allowed by law for many, many years to band together, uh, to unite farmers' bargaining power, rather than to, to divide farmers' bargaining power. And this, of course, is what the NFO has urged uh, constantly. Let's get our cooperative marketing structure together so that we do have a totally united bargaining structure uh, for the farmers' milk products. Now let's take a lesson here, uh, the dairymen, I was from the meat producers, uh, primarily because they have shown the greatest success in bargaining at this point. What are some of the steps that must be taken in order to bargain effectively uh, for your products? Number one, of course, is to sign an NFO membership agreement as an individual dairyman. This is the first step we must all take. This is the structure of the NFO. This is the foundation of it, and a very necessary foundation of it. After this uh, is done, then you're in a position to go to your local buyer, handler, whether it's cooperative or independent, milk handler, and urge him to be a part of the NFO program by signing one of our master contracts for milk. This is the second step. At this point, you're in a position to bargain together, you're in a position to sell together, and then the next and final step, you will be in a position to price your products together. This, coupled with managing any of surplus production that might exist or develop is the steps that will have to be taken for successful bargaining. I have a reprint here from the Wichita Eagle, or the, yes, Eagle and Beacon, a uh, newspaper from Wichita, Kansas. And it has this to say about the NFO. Perhaps the most spectacular development in farm marketing in the history of tilling land has been the 10-year growth of the National Farmers Organization. It not only can work, but it is working. Farmers for a healthy and stable farm economy join the NFO. Remember, everyone will join and support the NFO just as soon as they understand it. The National Farmers Organization is an organization dedicated to raising and stabilizing farm prices through collective bargaining. Farmers help improve your bargaining power by selling all of your grain and livestock through the new NFO marketing and livestock arrangements and in-position grain sales that have been set up in your area. Tune in again next week at the same time for another edition of U.S. Farm Report, a weekly program that delves into the many vital issues affecting American agriculture today. U.S. Farm Report, a rural area public relations program, is brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this TV viewing area. For more information on the National Farmers Organization, contact the county organization in your county or write to NFO Corning, Iowa. Farmers remember, collective bargaining is the key to farmers' success. Join the NFO today.